When Rebecca Coggett woke up in the middle of the night, on the 29th of September 2012, she knew that something was seriously wrong with her daughter Alexandra. What unfolded next is every parent's worst nightmare. From the outside, Alexandra Coggett's relationship with Clayton Whitmore appeared to be a happy one, but hours after Alexandra sent one final tweet she read, should have known her boyfriend would end her life. Alexandra's life had only just begun, the 18-year-old had recently enrolled at the college in Brockport near Rochester, New York. Her goal was to graduate with a degree in communications. Now that she was in college, she was 150 miles away from her hometown at New Hartford. It was at her high school in New Hartford, that she met Clayton Whitmore, who she had been dating for a year. Both Alexandra and Whitmore were involved in sports at their high school. Alexandra was the captain of the swimming team, and Whitmore played hockey. He was featured on WKTV, you took her as an athlete of the week in 2010. During the summer before Alexandra moved to college, she took a trip to New York City with her friend Mary Kate Heaton and their mothers. Alexandra and Whitmore had decided to continue with their relationship when Alexandra moves, making their relationship a long-distance one. In New York City, the girls and their mother spent some time shopping, and they saw the Phantom of the Opera on Broadway. Mary Kate later said that the couple appeared to be perfectly content with their relationship, and many felt that Alexandra loved her boyfriend a lot. Alexandra never gave any sign that she was a victim of domestic violence but she had the voicemails to prove it. In September 2012, Alexandra was finally a freshman in college, starting a new chapter in her life. Whitmore was attending Utica College. Alexandra was described as funny and bubbly. She had been on the swim team in high school, and was now on the college swim team. Alexandra was described as the heart of the team and was always there to cheer her friends on. On September 28, 2012, a Friday, Alexandra was excited because Clayton was coming up for a weekend visit. Around 3 p.m., Alexandra went to her friend Samantha's dorm room and asked if she could borrow some clothes. Alexandra then said goodbye and went to a swim team meeting. The meeting had ran long and Clayton arrived before it was over. Alexandra had texted him please don't kill me, I'm so so sorry. Clayton said it was fine, and the two met up soon after. They went to dinner, to a friend's house, and returned back to the dorm room at 12.17 a.m. At 2.42 a.m., Alex's mom Becky, called the SUNY Brockport campus police. She had a feeling that something was wrong, and asked them to do a welfare check. The student who signed Whitmore in, from McLean Hall, as a guest, would later say that it looked like the couple had been arguing in the early hours of the 29th of September. Alexandra's mother, Rebecca, had a premonition something was wrong with Alexandra. At 2.42 a.m., Alexandra's mom, Rebecca, called the SUNY Brockport campus police. She said that she had a feeling that something was wrong, and asked them to do a welfare check. Officer Michael Johnson arrived knocked on the door, and entered when he realized it unlocked. Inside the dorm room, he discovered a bloody scene. Alexandra's dorm room was covered in blood. There was blood on the bed, door, and pillow. A young woman was found face down on the floor, and it was clear that she had been beaten. The young woman was pronounced dead, and as a Jane Doe. The police knew that it was Alexandra's room, but the young woman on the floor had dark, almost black hair. In the pictures in the room, Alexandra had very light hair. It was also very hard to tell who the woman was based on how badly she had been beaten. However, the police did recognize the man in the photos as Clayton Whitmore. They had issued him a ticket that night for having an open container. The police spoke about the incident. Clayton, and a female, who was later identified as Alexandra, were walking on the sidewalk. Clayton had an empty container which the police had to issue him a ticket for. They described Clayton as being cooperative, but that he had dropped the beer can after walking away. They told him that they could issue him an additional $100 fine. Clayton picked it up, and walked on the opposite side of the street. Alexandra stayed on the side that they had been on, which really stuck out to the police. 
After the ticket incident, Alexandra had posted a tweet at 12.13 a.m., saying should have known. She and Clayton returned to her dorm room at 12.17 a.m. The police still believe that Alexandra's roommate was the deceased. They believe there might have been an altercation between Alexandra and her roommate, and that she and Clayton were on the run. At 3 a.m., all of the questions that everyone had, would be answered. Scott Whitmore, Clayton's dad, called the Oneida County Dispatch. He said his son had just confessed to him that he killed someone. Scott didn't know anything else. The dispatch told Scott to call his son to get more information. Scott called back a few minutes later, and said that Clayton had a girlfriend in Brockport. The dispatch then received a call from Sandra, Clayton's mom. Sandra believed her son was in Canada. However, the dispatch knew that Clayton was still in the area. Clayton then contacted the Oneida County Dispatch, himself, at 3.44 a.m., telling them, I did something, and that he wanted to turn himself in. Clayton Whitmore was picked up by New York State Troopers, at a rest stop off the New York State Freeway. The police also learned that Alexandra's roommate was alive, and had been staying in another dorm room that night. They met with her in person, and learned that Alexandra had recently dyed her hair dark. Alexandra Coggett was the young woman that had been killed in her room. In the interrogation room, Clayton was asked about his relationship. Clayton said that everything was fine, but later admitted that he felt disrespected by Alexandra that night. Alexandra had raised her voice at him, but was happy and giggly around other people. Clayton said that he was aggravated, and even more so after he received the ticket for the open container. He said when they arrived back at the dorm room, they began talking about cheating. Alexandra had mentioned that she saw a picture on his phone a while back, and started pushing him. Clayton said that he just snapped. He threw Alexandra against the wall, and beat her to death. Clayton said, it was like watching an animal suffer, and that he couldn't watch someone he loved suffer. Clayton was charged with second degree murder. Clayton pleaded not guilty. His trial began in the spring of 2014. The prosecution had Clayton's own words, the crime scene, and other physical evidence against Clayton. Rebecca, Alexandra's mom, would later tell the court that she felt her daughter leave her, and that she fell to her knees. Knowing that Whitmore was visiting her daughter, she repeatedly called and texted her daughter's phone and Whitmore's phone. Whitmore finally answered his phone at 2.30 a.m., and lied to Rebecca about Alexandra's well-being. He said that she was sleeping. Clayton's ex-girlfriend testified that she too had once been abused by him. She said that he had choked her, and she didn't think he'd ever let go. Another friend of Clayton's said that after a night of drinking, Clayton had grabbed a knife, and pointed it at a group of people. He described Clayton as looking possessed. The defense didn't deny that Clayton had killed Alexandra. However, they said it was manslaughter, not second-degree murder. They said on the night of the murder, Clayton was under the influence of extreme emotional disturbance. They said Clayton was a victim of abuse too, at the hands of his father Scott. Clayton had admitted to the dispatch that Scott had abused the family for years. Clayton wrote in a text message to Alexandra and her family, that he didn't want to become his father, and that he was sorry for something he couldn't take back. After three weeks of testimony, the jury deliberated. They found Clayton guilty of second-degree murder. He was sentenced to 25 years to life. No one in Alexandra's family knew of any of the abuse that Alexandra went through. Clayton had left her several threatening voicemails, and she saved about 30 of them. The voicemails weren't admissible in court. Family friends of the Coggets, Sandra, and Paige Whitney, created the Purple Pinky Charitable Foundation. It raises awareness for domestic and relationship abuse. It encourages women to paint their pinkies purple to show their support. 
Purple was also Alex's favorite color. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you enjoy these videos, drop a like in there too. Thanks for watching, and if you would like to see a certain video on something, leave it in a comment below. Until next time, stay safe.